Welcome to High Tech Heroes, a program which takes you behind the scenes of today's high tech industries, where you can meet the people and examine the ideas creating tomorrow's technology. And now coming to you from the studios of Foothill College and Cable Access Los Altos, high atop the mountains overlooking Silicon Valley, here's your host, Sherwin Gooch. Hello, I'm Sherwin Gooch. Welcome to High Tech Heroes. We have two computer musicians as our guests this week. Our first guest is the synthetic instrument builder of the duo. He received his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Rice University and immediately began designing signal processing equipment for ESL, where he designed one of the first digital radios. In his spare time, he began building equipment for Stanford University's Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics, which led to master's and doctorate degrees in electrical engineering from Stanford, where he now teaches. Our guest has published a large number of articles on digital signal processing and is well known for applying digital signal processing to music applications. He is now in the process of bringing music via DSP to the next computer. Our first guest is also a dynamic classical guitarist whose roots go back to playing Jimi Hendrix in junior high. And so it's my pleasure to welcome a fine instrument builder and an extension of the classical tradition, Julius Smith, to our program. Hello, Julius, and welcome to High Tech Heroes. Hi, Sherwin. Great to be here. Great. Now, the other half of our computer music duo is a professional composer. Although he began playing the violin at eight years old, his technological achievement didn't begin until he was 10, when he earned his ham radio license. He wrote his first string quartet in high school, where he also learned to play the guitar, mandolin, cello, and bass guitar. After high school, he toured with a bluegrass band for two years and then studied composition, first at Ithaca College and then Bennington, where he graduated with a specialty in music. While working as a consultant on various computer programs, including biotechnology programs to do gene searching and matching, he earned his master's and doctorate degrees in music from Stanford University. He then taught at Stanford, wrote commissioned compositions, and published a number of papers on digital synthesis until he, too, was asked to join Next, Incorporated. And so I'd like to welcome a composer who writes in English, music, and C, David Jaffe, to our program. Hello, David. And welcome Hi, to High Tech Heroes. Thanks. Great. So how did you guys get started working together? Um, it began, I think, well, I first met Julius, actually, when I was a student at Stanford. I just arrived and was trying to learn something about uh, digital signal processing. And he was in the process of writing a tutorial on the subject. So I became the guinea pig, <laughs> and uh, that worked out nicely. Then, a little bit later, I had a commission to do a piece for eight guitars, uh, soprano, and, and computer-generated tape. And I was trying to find some sound that, would, that I thought would bridge the gap between the computer and the live uh, elements in the piece. So I wanted to have something that would be like a pluck string. And I was trying various things and wasn't quite getting what I wanted. Then, it turned out I was playing in a string quartet at the time, mm -hmm. and the violist, uh, Alex Strong, was, had just discovered a, a remarkable new technique. So I spoke with him. He agreed to, uh, to fill me in on the technique and started working with it. Um, however, it still wasn't quite uh, able to, to be musically expressive. It still needed, needed some extensions. So I went to Julius, and, and he started um, helping me to make the string more expressive in a musical context. And maybe you can Using explain. Using digital signal processing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the first problem was we had to get it in tune. David was trying to work at the, the all composers try to work at the lowest possible sampling rate so that they can get as, most, uh, get as much uh, computing done per uh, unit time of their sound as they right. can. And so at the low sampling rates, this algorithm had severely quantized pitch. And so you couldn't quite tune it where you wanted to. So the first thing to do was figure out how to tune it. And I, I didn't want to increase the complexity very much, so I introduced a little all-pass filter. And I'll show you a diagram of that later on. Um, so that's you know, a good example of you know, a, a signal processing technique. And it found its way into this uh, simple instrument and uh, really helped it. And, and we had a number of other extensions that we And provided. so you're talking about a specific application of digital signal processing. And this is called mm -hmm. Carpal Strong algorithm? For yeah, the initial synthesis? algorithm was Carpal Strong. And we added some signal processing techniques to essentially upgrade it to, uh, you know, to the best quality that the ear can, mm -hmm. can perceive. What exactly is digital signal processing? 
Well, digital signal processing is the digital form of signal processing. It needs to be digital so that you can operate on the computer. So all your algorithms are, are uh, computerized or in digital hardware. And signal processing itself is uh, a body of technology for processing signals. And, uh -huh. and signals can be anything. They started out being, you know, well, something usually from a microphone or some sort of uh, natural uh, phenomenon being recorded into some kind of function of time. And signal processing is the body of mathematical transformations you can make on these signals to extract information or to enhance the information you have or to achieve some other end like make music out of uh, pure imagination. So digital signal processing is like signal processing only use difference equations instead of differential equations? Right, so yeah. Quantized? That's, right, can, the quantization leads to that. Can you do everything with digital sig signal processing that you can do with uh, analog signal processing? You can imitate all analog sig signal processing because in the case of audio, the ear's uh, perception is limited to about 20 kilohertz bandwidth. Mm -hmm. By sampling at greater than 40,000 samples per second, the, the computer is able to represent in a list of numbers any sound that could ever be perceived by the ear. That's, uh, that's really interesting. Uh, what else have you worked on other than Carpal Strong? Are there other algorithms? Oh, yes. Well, actually, I was working on a violin algorithm when this came along. And <clears throat> when I saw the algorithm, I recognized it as a special case of a more general physical modeling algorithm that was going on in the physics literature at the time. And I was working on the violin problem as, as a way of getting involved in, in making musical instruments and bringing the latest techniques to bear on, on the making of instruments. And that led me to a lot of different instruments. I've visited quite a few of them by now. So you really are the, the uh, instrument designer? That's my specialization, yeah. My, uh, my goal is to take the, the most sophisticated technology in electrical engineering, st statistics, mathematics, and bring it to the problem of advancing the orchestra in whatever way I can. You know, just try to find good things to do and do that's, them. That's great. So, so you think that you're an instrument builder just as people who built violins and built uh, pipe organs in the old days. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Uh, were, except that you used mathematics. That's right. That's the uh, the wood and the and the metal. Mm -hmm. I should interject that uh, um, a funny note is that Julius was terrorizing all the uh, musicians by threatening to take their instruments and hit them with a hammer right. in order to extract <laughs> the impulse response. Yeah. That turns out to be the best signal you can get out of an instrument if you want to mathematically model it. Is an impulse response. Yeah, you want to come up and hit it with an impulse. And a hammer is a good way to do that. A hammer is pretty close. It's not perfect, but... So uh, did you threaten to do this with uh, Stradivarius violins? And... Well, never got too close to a Stradivarius, but uh, there have been devices built that will pulse a very high-quality violin. Norman Pickering in uh, New York does that. In fact, he's, he's uh -huh. analyzed hundreds of violins, and I, I get his data, so I don't have to oh, hit so any have to do instruments that. myself. No, he has well, a very fine... Now, you guys brought along some, some pieces, I guess David in particular, to play us to demonstrate... Uh, a lot of these instruments and explain mm -hmm. the instruments and play okay. samples and we'll do that uh, right after this message. fellow techies. I'm Sherwin Gooch, the host of High Tech Heroes. Every week we profile another person who is creating tomorrow's technology. High Tech Heroes is a gonzo video production. We don't pretend we're not in the studio and we don't do any editing. You see everything that happens after we turn the cameras on. So what our guests say can't be taken out of context. You see the entire context. If you have a friend who would be a good guest on High Tech Heroes, please write and tell us. Include your friend's name, telephone number, and a list of their technological accomplishments. Send your letter to Sherwin Gooch, High Tech Heroes, Foothill College TV Center, 12345 El Monte Road, Los Altos Hills, California, 94022. Thanks. See you Thursday at 7.
Hello, and welcome back to High Tech Heroes. Talking here with Julia Smith and David Jaffe about uh, computer music and digital signal processing. And we're going to play some examples of music generated with digital signal processing on the next computer as soon as David tells us a little bit about what it's like to be a computer musician. Well, I uh, got interested in computer music uh, because one of the compelling aspects of it is that you can, um, you can assume roles that are traditionally not uh, the composer's responsibility. Traditionally, uh, the composer writes the music, hands it to players who are trained to perform mm -hmm. the music, and they play it on instruments built by professional instrument builders. As a computer composer, you have to fill all three of these roles, which is both a plus and a minus. The minus is that you have to have clear concepts about these things. Um, now, if I understand right, though, Julius fills the role of, of instrument builder, at least helps out in that respect. That's right, yeah. It's been a fruitful collaboration. And you guys have been collaborating for a long time? Something like uh, six, seven years. Mm -hmm. And it was Julius that uh, brought me into Next. Uh, the first example I'd like to play is from a piece called Silicon Valley Breakdown that I wrote in, back in 82. It's for four channels of computer-generated sound. The four speakers are placed at the four corners of the audience. The audience is in right, the middle. Right. And the example that I'll show, of course, we can't, we can't show four channels on TV, but in the uh, video I'm going to roll, you'll see the VU meters, and you'll be able to see the, the um, interplay between the channels. Now, of course, when you put this on a record, uh, you can't have four channels either. And we made a CD of this on Virgo, but we had to mix down the channels. OK, well, let's roll the videotape then. Mm -hmm. That was nice. Um, what's the next uh, example that we're going to talk about? Um, the next example is uh, from a piece called Impossible Animals, and it illustrates uh, several points. But I just wanted to mention that these, that example and the following, and the next mm -hmm. example and the one after were not done on the next machine. They were done at the uh, right. Center for Computer Research and Music and Acoustics at Stanford. Karma, right? Right. But the last two examples we'll play are going to be performed in, live in the studio on the next machine. Um, now, Impossible Animals is a piece for synthesized voices, solo voices, uh, and real chorus, live, I mean, human chorus and synthetic voices. Now, I did an interesting uh, thing in this piece. I took a bird sound and analyzed it using it, another technique developed by Julius and extracted the pitch and amplitude. And maybe Julius can say a few words about that. Oh, yeah, that's the, uh, <clears throat> the partial program. Uh, that's what we call it. It's essentially uh, an analysis technique in support of additive synthesis. Additive synthesis creates sounds by summing together fundamental vibrations like a tuning fork will make, sinusoids. And so what the partial program does is that it takes any recording and looks over it and finds out where there are peaks in the spectrum. And the spectrum is an energy versus frequency plot. And then it will track all the peaks and then dispatch oscillators to follow those peaks and resynthesize just the peaks of the spectrum. And the amazing thing we found was that in a lot of sounds, you only need a few peaks. And you can throw away all this mountainous terrain and replace it with a few peaks running through the uh, time frequency uh, plane and get a fantastic rendition of it. Piano is an example. With voice, you can do a great job with three of these sine waves amazingly. At least you can understand it. In the case of the bird song that David was working with, we uh, got it down to one, one single sinusoidal tracking oscillator. That's fairly amazing, and this is highly processed sound now. Right. Well, first we're going to play the recording of the bird sound. And right. You'll hear it's just from a record. There's hum and various problems. OK, well, go ahead. Let's roll the tape. Now I'm going to play a resynthesis using vocal synthesis um, with the, the uh, frequency mapped onto vowels. <laughs> 
This is going to be the same example, but this time in the context of the piece with the full chorus. Uh, this is the Hamilton College Chorus. It's about 60 voice, 40 voice. Oh, So that, that was a strip mapping, a strict mapping of pitch onto vowel sounds? Uh, more or less. It started with uh, the pitch analysis, but then I broke it up into individual chirps and tuned each chirp to match the pitches that the singers were singing. And I did a lot of things. I expanded the range, I mapped it onto vowels, and changed the set of vowels in time. OK. And, and how did you order the vowels? I mean, um, was there some particular no, ordering? Nothing to the... in particular. OK. I changed just it just arbitrary. for variety. Yeah. Okay. And it gave a nice effect because the chorus is, is telling the story and the, solo, the synthetic soloist is emoting, in a sense. Right. And uh, the next piece uh, we're going to hear is, is also one that you wrote, right? Right. This is uh, another snap of a, uh, snatch of a videotape um, in which I'm playing the mandolin outside. And the piece is called Bristlecone Concerto. And the next time you come back, we'll have you play the mandolin here in the studio. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. And this is a piece for mandolin, violin, and then one of the following, flute of each of the following, one, flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, trumpet, trombone, horn, harp, piano, and percussion, and computer-generated tape. But this is just one of the mandolin solo sections. Great. Well, let's see the tape. Was really nice. Um, I guess the next uh, next piece we're going to play is out of the next machine live. Huh? Right. And uh, Julius, you're going to tell us something about the patches for this. Is that right? Okay. Is this uh, velvet? Yes. Okay. Velvet is 
a real-time synthesis using the digital signal processor chip. There's a special microprocessor for digital signal processing that you can think of as an auxiliary processor in the machine. And it's capable uh, of doing quite a few voices in real time. So you're going to hear 10 voices in this particular piece. This was done by Doug Fulton. He's our documentation guy. And uh, it's all using this string algorithm or the enhancements of the string algorithm that we developed. And this diagram shows you, you know, roughly what's in it. It's got a delay line, which is one period long. So the number of samples in one period of sound, the sampling rate divided by the fundamental frequency. And we initialize that with some waveform. It doesn't matter what it is. White noise does a really good job. And we would typically filter that white noise to uh, get a dynamic control. There's also a low pass filter. And this is really critical for the string percept. If it's going to sound like a string, it's got to have some kind of a low pass filter in this feedback loop. So what happens is you have an initial random waveform, and it just goes round and around in a loop. And it generates a quasi-periodic sound. And the low pass filter makes the high frequencies decay faster than the low frequencies. And that's a critical element in a pluck string or any kind of string synthesis. And then we have a, an all pass filter for tuning it and a body filter for providing resonances, that sort of thing. So uh, OK, well, let's, let's hear it then. Let's uh, press the button. I'll get out of the way so you can see the screen. Great. If we're going to play uh, the other sample, we're going to have to be very quick about okay. it. Okay. So. One thing I wanted to point out about this is that you may have heard some uh, increasing, increasing tone, almost choral sounds. The way that was done was to actually make the loop unstable. The feedback in this loop went greater than one to keep the sound growing. And then when the sound got close to the clip threshold, it would come back down. That was a nice fine point that, uh, that was a nice technique that Doug thought of for extending the uh, range of applicability of this instrument. This next example is uh, a, a Balinese gamelan piece. It's for four Gendera instruments. And it uses FM to uh, produce you know, simulation of the Gendera instrument. Uh, it's a metal bar over a bamboo resonator uh, kind of instrument. And so this is a, a patch diagram of our full vibrato FM synth patch, which is actually more complicated than what you'll uh, necessarily hear in any one note. And what it does is that it has oscillators. The main oscillator is here. Can you see that? You have the main oscillator here and a modulating oscillator here. And then there may be some periodic and random uh, vibrato components in this vibra vibrato perturbation of the oscillator frequency. So this is a basic unit generator diagram for a computer music instrument. And so let's hear the Gendare example. Okay. And what gamelan tuning is from what part of the world? Uh, B Bali.
very interesting. Uh, that tuning is not possible to play, I guess, on any instrument except uh, except a computer. I mean, or in this part of the world. Or a gamma or a gamma. But the computer does allow a very easy control of the spectrum, so you can get inharmonic spectra, and you can get uh, any kind of non-Western tuning system that you want. You can even have a different tuning for each village of Bali that you visited to uh, record the, uh, the gamelan. Mm -hmm. And uh, is there anything else you'd like to say about uh, digital signal processing in general? Or I guess this is the most unique part of this computer, is that uh, it has digital signal processing built right into the CPU board. And this is a very that's, unusual I guess, feature. The, the most revolutionary feature of the machine, and I guess you're personally responsible for it, from what I understand. So. Well, in in my area of research, it's definitely the most interesting revolutionary aspect of the machine. It's it's one of many uh, very innovative, aggressive uh, design uh, points within the machine. And uh, for sitting down and, and advancing our understanding about musical instruments and, and computer composition music, it's, it's just a great well, workstation. Well, to, you're to you're be very, very lucky to be, uh, to be working at Next. I mean, you know, most, uh, most hackers give their eye teeth to be able to work there. And I guess uh, Steve Jobs and Seymour Cray are about the only two people left trying to push the, the field forward anymore. So mm -hmm. you guys are really lucky, and we're, we're really uh, glad that you could take the time to come here. Thank you. Well, thanks. It was great to be here. It's great, and, and uh, you know, keep writing your music. I know it must be difficult. Okay. So, well, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks for uh, coming. It's been my Maybe. pleasure. Julius? It's fun. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, come back again uh, anytime. Well, we'll have okay. to get some more demos together for you. Yeah, great. Thank you for joining us this week on High Tech Heroes. Be sure to tune in next week where we'll bring you more entertaining information about the people and ideas behind the scenes in high tech industry. And now, this is your announcer, Tony Brzees, wishing you the best of luck and a pleasant summer. Au revoir. This episode of High Tech Heroes has been made possible in part by grants from Jerry Brown Associates of Saratoga, California, Kinetic Microscience of San Jose, California, Cybernetic Arts of Sunnyvale, California, and Big D Closeouts of Sunnyvale, California. <laughs>